Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Ghosts of Sleeth by James Herbert. So this is um, part of a two book bind up, it also has 48 in it. Ghosts of Sleeth is the second David Ash book coming after Haunted, which I read not too long before I read this. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, I'm going to check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... The Ghosts of Sleeth. Can a ghost haunt a ghost? Can the dead reach out and touch the living? Can ancient evil be made manifest? These are the questions that confront psychic investigator David Ash when he delves into the mysterious events terrorising the community of Sleeth, a small quaint village hidden away in the Chiltern Hills. In Sleeth he will fear for his own sanity as each dark secret is unveiled and terrible malign forces are unleashed, for the full horror will be beyond imagination. Sleeth where the dead will walk the streets. So uh, we start out with um, like a little look at one of the cases that David's been on where there was an angel of death like terrifying people in a um, like old people's home. Um, it told them to die. Kate was startled. Uh -huh, that's why they call it the sleep angel. I suppose you could call it a kind of verbal euthanasia. That's unbelievable. Wait till you're old and tired and feel there's nothing left to do with your life anymore. Every other day. Yeah, relatable. We get a, a landlord uses the word grockles, which is like uh, kind of a slang term for people who come from out of town, which I like. You don't see that word very often. Um, and there was a child molester who is referred to in this. He sort of tormented one of the characters when they were young. Um, and eventually he cut off his own genitalia in his cell and had bled, by, and had bled to death by the next morning. I mean, you can't, you can't be too sad about that, can you, really? And uh, somebody gets attacked, um, and we get this. Uh, I'm told that's what he'll be charged with if he ever recovers, that is. How bad is he? asked Grace. Bad as you can get with your school bashed in. She shuddered, her clasped hands squirming against her plump stomach. Caldwell scraped off most of the boy's face with one of those plain things, which hardly helped matters. Dear God, it might be a blessing if Danny does pass away now he's got no face to speak of and a brain that's probably mashed potatoes. And we get this little line here. Uh, what you want about Lenny, grouch crick? I can't hear nothing. That's it, said Grover. There's nothing to hear. And that just reminds me of the, this scene from Red Dwarf, which is one of my favourite uh, TV shows, where somebody goes, Can you hear anything? No. Precisely, we can't hear anything. And do you know why we can't hear anything? Why? Because there are no sounds to hear. So you get a reference to, uh, well, you get a few references to Sir Francis Dashwood, Raken Occultist and founder of the Hellfire Club, his own secret society for devil worship. Um, so he comes from High Wycombe. In fact, my friend Dave's dog, uh, his old dog used to be called Dashwood, named after the Dashwood family. Uh, and there are lots of uh, areas like the Dashwood Estates here in Wycombe. Um, and again, because this is set in the Chiltern Hills, this is like right by where I live. Like I know villages like Sleeth, even though Sleeth doesn't actually exist. And we get this little um, conversation here. As somebody who quit smoking, I found this interesting. Um, so Ash wants to go for a cigarette. He goes, your chance to feel superior. Nah, I don't feel like it now. Good, you'll live longer. Yeah, by about two minutes. You might appreciate those two minutes when the time comes. It'll give me time for one last smoke. It's kind of how, how uh, you think as a smoker. This I related to as a serial insomniac, so there were few lights on in the village. Most people were deep in sleep. It was the others, the insomniacs, who felt the sudden coolness in the night air. An unexpected shiver, a stiffness in their bones, goosebumps on their flesh made them aware. These unfortunates quickly hurried to their beds, or if already there, wrapped bedclothes tightly around themselves. I got up at 8pm today. A little quote here, which I think is very true, especially as someone with uh, IBS, which is like a long-term health condition. Illness, she had found, was a lonely occupation, and in the middle of the night or the early hours of the morning, that loneliness was worse than anything she had ever known. And so we have this character called Mickey, who uh, his father locked him in the old bomb shelter. And I just want to read this paragraph because I think it's quite well written and gives you an idea of this guy's character. He's not a necessarily nice guy or a good guy, but he does feel like a well-rounded person. Mickey shuddered and drops of water were shaken from the leaves he crouched beneath. They fell onto his neck and he hastily wiped them away with a grubby hand. He drew himself in, clutching his raised knees with his arms, the loaded crossbow still gripped tightly in one clenched fist. The last two nights had been the worst he had ever known, even worse than the time the old man had locked him in the bomb shelter at the bottom of the garden for the night. The concrete pit was a leftover from the war, built by his grandfather, who thought the German bombers had a special mission to kill him in particular. It had been a great joke amongst the villagers, but even funnier was the fact that Grandad had died of a heart attack when rejoicing the end of the war by over-strenuously ringing the church bells. Afterwards, the bomb shelter had been used by Mickey's father as an apple store, and these days Mickey hid his poacher's gains in there. 
But one night, the night in question, when Mickey was 11 years of age, the old man had locked him inside the shelter, the pit, the cell, the bloody tomb, for some mischief or other, stealing probably, and left him there till the next morning. Mickey had wailed to be let out, and he had screamed when he heard the rats scrabbling around in the pitch black, and he had screamed and screamed some more when one of the creatures had run across his lap. But still, Dad had not come back and unlocked the door, probably because by that time he was asleep in the armchair in his usual drunken stupor. Mickey's mother had long since run off with a tallyman, who had called weekly for the payment on the living room suite. He wouldn't have heard much anyway, nor would the neighbours, because the walls of the shelter were eight inches thick. When the door had been opened the following morning, Mickey had rushed out white face and had thrown himself into his father's arms, swearing he would never be bad again. He would never take another thing that didn't belong to him. And for a moment, just for the merest fraction in time, he had been held close against his father's chest, something Mickey had never experienced before or since. He had been quickly thrust away with a curt admonishment, but not before he'd looked up and caught the shock and shame in the old man's face. And uh, again, this is another bit with Mickey as well. Um, he has a stomach ache. And it, and it goes, he knew the cause, of course, because it wasn't a new pain. It happened most times when he was out on a job with Lenny and Dent. In part, it was due to his hunger. He could never eat before a nighttime jaunt with his two companions in crime. But mainly it was anxiety that brought it on, which he would never admit to his cronies. Lenny Grove always laughed at him when he complained of gut ache, but it was no bloody joke. Mickey's doctor, Old Stapley, had explained about acids eating into the stomach walls when certain people got over anxious, especially when there was no food inside them. The doctor, creepy old git, had warned him off booze and greasy food and not eating at the right times. But what the fuck? Life was for doing what you wanted, when you wanted, right. Yeah, right. Um, and as somebody with anxiety and a lot of stomach aches, you know, I knew what he was talking about there. And he's holding um, a crossbow and then he falls and we get this, which I just thought was a nice bit of Herbertian gore, you know. The fall ended, but the clamour went on. Mickey was deafened by the noise, his own stream contributing to this, and blinded by the swirling dust and denser darkness. He was stunned too, and not just by the awkward landing. Through the confusion of falling debris, the splintering of wood, his own screaming, Mickey had heard, felt, something like a spring being released, and instantly his open jaw was snapped shut by something thudding into it from below. His scream was immediately plugged as that something continued on its way into the roof of his mouth to burst into the open again through the cartilage and bone of his nose. The short quarrel lodged there, its slickened tip protruding from the bridge of his nose, its feathered end pressed against his neck. Ricky, Mickey writhed like some stuck animal, suddenly comprehending what had happened, yet still not believing it, while debris and powdered dust fell on and around him. Hmm, that's no fun, is it? And so we get another reference to Sir Francis Dashwood. By the way, if you've read my story in Local Haunts, my story was called A Stone's Throw. Uh, Francis Dashwood appears in that as well. He went on to find references to Sir Francis Dashwood, a familiar name to him and, so it would seem, a close associate of Lockwood. That hardly came as a surprise, for the Irishman was aware that Dashwood was notorious in this area in the 1700s as an occultist and founder of the infamous Hellfire Club, a clandestine organisation that engaged in satanic rites and aristocratic dissipation. We get a reference to something being a portent, which I just thought was interesting because I read a book called Portent recently, which I think was James Herbert, but it might have been Michael Crichton. <laughs> Um, and I just thought this line was interesting about the marriage between Tom Ginty and uh, Rosemary, his wife. Tom Ginty took a tottering step towards his wife, and Rosemary screamed afresh as she scrambled away from him. There had never been an honest love between them, only initially a joint need, soon followed by a tolerance of each other, and this was eventually replaced by a mutual loathing, so there was no guilt when she fled from the bleeding monster that was her husband. We get used to the word pleadingly, which annoys me slightly. And we get, uh, have you ever heard the term psychopomp, David? Um, and it is defined as uh, a conductor of souls in the other world, a sort of guide or usher, if you like. I have heard the term purely because I interviewed a band called Psychobomb. Their, their singer was called Reg the Nose. And another reference to Dashwood and the Hellfire Club. So we get um, uh, a member. No, not at all. The Reverend would tell you if you were able. Sebastian Lockwood was the founder of the Hellfire Club. And Sir Francis Dashwood, who was always taking the credit or the blame, was merely one of his acolytes. And let me add this, nobody at that time, nor this, knew the true extent of their activities, but I think at least you might now have an idea. So yeah, The Ghosts of Sleeth by James Herbert, I don't think it's his best, it was better than Haunted, um, it just felt a little bit more matured and like longer, long enough to make it actually something to get your teeth into, whereas Haunted was more, more like a novella. I would still give it just like a 3.5 out of type 5 and it's like a mid-tier James Herbert book but if you're into haunted stuff um, you might enjoy it. I think I probably enjoyed it a little bit more because it's set basically right by where I live as well. Um, but yeah, it was just alright. 
So there we have it, that's what I made of The Ghosts of Sleep by James Herbert. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.